Welcome back to the Metal Voice. You got it. John Bush, Armored Saint, right. Category 7. Thank you, rid of me. Perrin, you want to do the honors? You want to tell everyone who's in this band? Who was in this band? It's like a regular... How, how, is, how would you say it? You say uh, an Armored Saint, a Machine Head, an Overkill, an Exodus, and an Adrenaline Mob. Go to a bar and... <laughs> I guess this is what you get. So yeah, we got uh, we got John Bush from Armored Saint on vocals. You got Phil Demel uh, from Machine Head on guitar. Mike Orlando from Adrenaline Mob on guitar, uh, and a great thrashy rhythm section of uh, Jack Gibson from Exodus and uh, Jason Bittner from Overkill. So uh, a who's who uh, of, of the metal world. Uh, hell of an all star team there. Not July twenty six on Metal Blade Records. That's when this album will be released. John, go ahead. I was just going to say, All Star sounds better than the, some people have said Supergroup, and I was like, eh, I don't, I don't really like the way that sounds. That sounds a little bit like pompous, but All Star uh, Group sounds kind of cool for some reason. So you're with on tour with Armored Saint, and then you lost your voice. I mean, is everything okay there in that department? <laughs> It is. I'm. I'm. I'm back to being uh, better, and uh, you know that was really annoying and sucked. But uh, it's part of life. It happens, and you know what are you going to do? You just keep going, and you know I pretend like I, I'm like an athlete who got injured, and uh, and you're just fighting to get back uh, into the game. You know, so it's 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 all good. It's 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 a lot better, and uh, you know it was really annoying and. Um, was it a cold or just laryngitis or it probably was the beginning of a cold that i got you know i didn't really think too much of it but then um you know it kind of go, goes into like your chest area and when that happens it becomes really difficult to have any power and sing and um it's it sucks it's a drag you know and that's happened a couple times to me now but um all in all, like, you know, we played this whole long tour of seven weeks and uh, it was a lot of work. So I did a lot of, so I, I don't want to beat myself up too much because I did a lot of work on it. And um, and the Wasp tour, you know, a couple of years back, the same thing, you know. So um, it's, you know, it happens and, you know, singers, it, I, I, like I said, I'm not the last singer to have a voice problem and I won't be, you know, I won't be the first and I won't be the last. So it's, um, you just try to fight back. But, you know, I was... In the Montreal, I was like, by during that run, I was like singing, awesome. killing it, killing it. Yeah, so, killing it. you know, it's it's frustrating, but uh, you know, I'm trying to just move on from it. Yeah, I mean, I guess one of the rigors of modern touring is, you know, to keep the show on the road, you got to sometimes do five, six shows a week for it all to make sense, given what a a bus costs and what gas for the bus costs and what everything else costs. You know, you probably maybe whereas you used to need to be able to play three or four shows a week, now you're probably looking at five or six. I know, I know you were doing even off nights, uh, headline shows also. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's that can't be easy for anybody, let alone you. Yeah, it's you know, it, I it's not so, especially at sixty. You know, it's, honestly, it's not something I want to do. Every time I see that schedule, I just like shake my head and go, "Come on!" And and, and Todd was feeling the same, and they were playing longer. We were doing headline shows sporadically, but they were playing every night. And, you know, he was pretty grumpy about it, but um, yeah, it's, you know, it's in the way we sing, it's not like, you know, you know, he's crazy, has this crazy range and, and really I sing a lot of highs, and a lot of lows and um, really it was a lows that was struggling with that towards the end, but um, the highs are still there, thank God. But, you know, the, the reality is, is that it's it's not just one register where we're singing, There's it's all over the place. So. Um, it, when it affects your voice, it affects a lot of different things. And um, and then I, I don't know how to do anything but just go full throttle. So I probably push through it, and then next thing you know, you're thrashed. But, um, you know, it, it's whatever. We're going to Europe in a month. and uh, it Oh, was yeah, that too. So, yeah. And uh, that, that, even though it's, it's not the crazy schedule as far as too many days in a row, we are doing some festivals and then some headlining shows. So the timing will be weird as far as like – like I just saw the time for Brutal Salt and we go on at like 4.30 and then you could be playing a headlining show the night before or, you know, Vakken, we go on at noon and which we're like one of the first bands at Vakken, which, you know, I'm sure it'll still be great, but I was a little grumpy about that. But I was like, can we not play the night before? So I'm like playing till like 11 o'clock at a headline show and then I got to play at noon in front of thousands of people like. Come on, man. Yeah. Who's the operations manager cool. around here? Who's managing the logistics? Yes. Well, I mean, I, 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 Bakken apparently doesn't release their, their um, 
you know, they're listing until months later. So once you commit, and then and I was talking to my agent and I was like, dude, he's like, I can't do anything. I was like, okay, well, what about the show before? Can we reschedule that? And we ended up rescheduling it. So I was happy about that. But like, you know, it's just, look, I mean, you're just, it's, it's just not something that's conducive to touring at my age, the way I sing, the way we perform. I mean, I would say puts out every night, man. We really do. We like work hard out there. So like, you know, and we're not 30, you know, I'm just, I have no problem saying it. I know there's people that do it and then kudos to them. You know, Bip Byford is amazing and, you know, Jagger for that matter. But like, you know, I, I can't, I don't want to do that because it's just, it's, I'm just going to not be happy. I'm just going to be grumpy and I'll probably not be at the top level. And when you play Bach in, you kind of want to give your best performance, yeah. not yeah. come off of playing a small yeah. club show in Poland the night before where you finish playing at like 10, 30, 11 at night. You know, it's just, and then drown. You, know, you know, you know, it's strange, John, like we saw you in Montreal and we, you're, you guys are amazing with Armored Saint. And I was actually in Maryland after when you, your voice went out. And actually, I saw Joey Vera and I saw Jeff and and they were all down, man. They were like, oh, man, you know, he just, his voice, you know. And it was just, it was strange. It was just, I was oh, there. you saw him at the M3? Were you at M3? I, I was at M3. Oh. I was there and I saw Joey and I saw and I saw yeah. Jeff and I actually talked to Jeff. And yeah. They're all down. The guys were all down, you know. They were, yeah, they were, so. they were sad, you know. It I mean, you know, we... We had to go to a headlining show that night in this town called Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, which is like near Harrisburg. And I was really bummed because the ticket sales were good and we had a lot of VIPs. And I mean, I feel the worst because I'm yeah. not only letting myself down, but I'm letting fans down. But, you know, again, I try to. What are you going to gonna do? You guys are, are sports guys. So what I just try to. Do? The only way to get through it, otherwise, my wife will like be pulling out all her hair, dealing with my mania because she has to deal with all my neurosis about it. And you know, the reality is I just try to say I'm injured and I can't play and that's it. Like, you know, but, you know, but, but it's a you testament, it, but, but let fans know this. It's a testament to that. You guys are actually, you're singing live. You're not playing for oh, yeah. backing tracks. And no. that's the, so fans have to understand this is the real deal. There's no tapes here. You're not going to fake it. And you're right. freaking giving it all. Yeah, it's a muscle, well, man. It's a muscle. And I, and I actually did perform a couple of shows. I just didn't sound good. And I know I'm like going out there going, oh, this is not going to be great. But I just did it. And you pummeled through. But but you have to think of the long run. And it's like, okay, if this is not going to just keep, you know, again, I'm a big basketball fan on top of hockey. And I'm a big Celtics fan. And their Porzingis is like their key, one of their key players this year. And the guy got hurt in like one of the first playoff games and missed like 10 playoff games. Now he came back. and But it's like, it just it just happens. You're you're. I mean, we're we're kind of athletes, especially singers and maybe drummers. And like you're, you know, if you get injured, you're injured. It's just the way it is, and it's it sucks. It's 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 terrible. But like, I mean, there's nothing I could do other than beat the crap out of myself, which I do, and I get really <laughs> down. And, you know, like, oh, and you have backup, and you have backup singers of, ready to go, <laughs> like backup I goalies. Of, I give a bunch of money to these doctors of the money I'm earning. I'm like, uh, so, but like, what are you going to do? It's like, so, anyway. so, 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 so I guess in a nutshell, you've just described, and it's a wonderful thing, how busy Armored Saint is again. And I think we're all, you know, the metal world is a better place with Armored Saint uh, working and busy and touring North America and touring Europe and uh, preparing new music. But we're talking about this thing, Category Seven today. So where does as well. <laughs> cata, where does Category Seven fit into all of this? So how did how with everything you're doing of Armored Saint, and I'm sure the other guys are all busy with their bands too. Like how did this all come together? I guess let's start at the start. And how did Category Seven form? Um, you know, it was as simple as I knew Phil from Metal Legions. I mean, I I, I didn't know the only guy I really didn't know was Mike, and um, I knew the other guys you know a little bit. We weren't like real good friends, but we were acquaintances. But Phil and I had done the thing with Metal Legions a few times. We actually went to Rio and, and did the Rock and Rio together. And um, so he's a great guy and, you know, just, you know, a veteran, and humble, down to earth. And he's just, he's, you know, a great player, of course. And um, he was saying, hey, I got this project with this other guy. And, and he told me who Mike was. And he goes, you know, would you be interested in, in maybe doing it? And I was like, well, I got to hear it. You know, I don't know anything until I actually hear the music and then I can give you my honest assessment of it and at least in pertaining to me working on it. So he sent it to me a couple of songs and I was like, wow, this is 
pretty awesome. So I said, let me let me try to write it. Let me try to write some songs and see what comes out. And if it's cool and we all are feeling good about it, then we'll take a step. And and we did. And we wrote a couple songs. And then okay, it was like okay, let's write a couple more. And um, the next thing we know, we had enough for a record. So it's like okay, well, let's get a deal and put out a record. And um, and and yeah, that's about as far as I've gotten um, <laughs> as far as personally. Um, you know, other people are working on stuff we have a manager larry mazer is awesome he's very driven by it and um, really it comes down to the public you know what people think you know that'll determine a lot what happens but um you know you got to understand everybody else is in other bands including phil who i think is in europe right now with um with um carrie kane and stuff so like wow. people are are doing other things but we'll see what what comes out of it but you know the songs i think are pretty scathing and really powerful stuff. And if there will be tour dates in the future, it's based on the reaction or what the feeling or the vibe you're getting from the feedback, I guess, from the fans. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking, to be honest. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's a new band to some degree, of course. So there's that, but you know, you want to, you want to see what people think and, and how excited they get. And then at the same time, like, um, you know, I think that we don't want to go out and, I mean, I don't want to go out and just like play 25 club shows in front of who knows how many people, even though we have a reputation, uh, and, you know, on our own individually, you know, you want to have people there you want to have like some good shows and, I think, I mean, not that everybody's snobby in the band, I think, but everybody's toured pretty well. So I don't think anybody is going to like go and get in a van and like, you know, just rough it. You know, that's just the truth. I'm, I'm not you know, going to do that. I could speak for everybody else. So like, you know, I don't expect, you know, us to get you know the Metallica tour, but at the same time, you know, you want to have something that's going to be good shows where everyone feels good about it and, you know, and who knows? I mean, you know, some maybe some festivals and 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 determine everything by that. So we'll see. Now, uh, Jimmy and I have heard the album over the last couple of days, and I'll tell everyone it's a great record. Uh, no ballads, no let up. It's a pretty aggressive record, as you alluded to, uh, uh, John. As far as I can remember, like there's some guys you know who do some of these all star group things who are in three or four different bands, and I don't know if you've kind of done this before i think you've always kind of just been loyal to the band you've been in so when you were writing for this how do you kind of separate because i think i've heard that armored saint is kind of working on some material as well so how do you kind of separate yeah this is kind of more of an armored saint thing and this is more something i feel like i can use for category seven like where where's that dividing line for you how does that all happen well, it's funny. Um, I was telling another uh, person I did an interview with earlier about this, and, and this is what happened um, during some of it. Joey was actually doing the Merciful Fate stuff, and um, so we were not doing anything with Saint. We weren't writing or we weren't playing, and um, and so I had this other project that I was doing with a buddy of mine. Um, they kind of got off the ground around the same time, and that's like a, this blues country, like rock and roll thing. That's like Little Richard meets Steve Earle, and it's really cool, but it's d very different. And him and I just kind of started doing it, and um, he's the guitar player of it, and he's an engineer, has his own studio. And so I told him, I go, I have this other thing that I'm kind of doing, and I suck as in, I can't like record anything. It'll just sound terrible. I recorded like, I think the song was in Stitches, and I did a version of it on Pro Tools in my home, and I was like, this is terrible. It sounds horrible. <laughs> So I was like, can I, will you record me and I'll pay you. And then, and then we'll also work on your thing and our, our thing. And, and um, at the same time kind of thing. And he goes, great, no problem. So one day I would go over to his house and we would record one of the songs or that became uh, this thing called electric spaghetti, which we have. And then the next day I go, okay, now I'm going to come over and I'm going to record a category seven song. And he goes, okay, great. So he actually recorded a lot of the vocals and a lot of the vocals that we kept for the record that were like demos um, at his house, in his bedroom, you know, at his apartment. And um, and it you know, just was sounding awesome. And so then you're like, I, in, in that span of, I don't know, 10 months, eight months, six months, I don't know, remember what it was. Well, I wrote probably with the two things combined about close to 20 songs. And it was really cool because 
it took me out of what I normally do in the faint world. And it gave me a chance to kind of work on these two things simultaneously that were very different from one another, but with the same engineer and the same uh, you know, guy that I'm working with in this other project. And um, it just kind of, like I said, it just took me elsewhere. So I think that part was easy for me to kind of separate a little bit. And, um, and it was fun to do that. And, um, you know, it, it took for me to be able to like write all these songs, I think was just helpful as a writer and as a singer. And it kind of just, it, it proved that, hey, I, I have a lot to say and I, I don't have a writer's block and I have some, a lot of ideas here and they're very different. So, and that, that thing is really cool. And I'd love to have you guys hear it one day because there's some demos and they're killer. It's fun. Um, again, very different and it's not metal. Um, so, but this is metal. And, and so, yes, I do. I think the key also is to just try not to repeat yourself. And that's hard to do. You know, um, I've made a lot of records. If you combine, you know, all the Saint and the Anthrax records and now this, you know, and, and, and what I'm always pushing myself is just try not to repeat a melody, try not to repeat words, try not to, um, which I don't always achieve that because I'm not like a, you know, uh, Harvard graduate in English where, you know, my vocabulary is very vast. I mean, I use a thesaurus a lot and it's very helpful, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's always trying to do something that you haven't done. And I think, um, it's, you know, when it comes to metal, it's a lot more trying to do that. Um, but in the end, I think it sounds different. And I think it sounds, you know, I, what I tell people is I also try to just gravitate to the musicians that I'm playing with and, Playing with Joey and you know Gonzo and Phil and Jeff is different than playing with Scott and Charlie and Frankie and and also now it's different from you know playing with these guys. So um, it's it's trying to connect to those people and having them kind of maybe bring another element of my personality and style out. Hopefully that is the case. Do you, do you think this is going to be like you've talked about this for years? Can this band also serve as a vehicle to play that Anthrax era music? I don't know. Another guy just told me that. Um, <laughs> yeah, everybody just keeps asking the same question, well, right? Even Phil, even Phil Demo has asked me that. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's something that we could discuss. Um, I had this idea, although I haven't told anybody about it, uh, in regard to doing the anthrax thing, which I, I've been wanting to do that. I don't want to go out and do 30 dates. I don't want to do that. But I do want to do some selective shows with that at some point um, because I think it would be cool. And again... Time is slightly of the essence based on my age and the realities of life. And um, so it's it's just a matter of, of maybe. You know what? I think this is a marriage. This is a marriage. This band also playing some anthrax. This is you get both. You get to fill up the room. Yeah. I'm just thinking yeah. marketing here. I'm just thinking marketing. I'm just, I'm just thinking it out here. Play it out. No, spitballing. You're, you're you're right on the money with all that, and and you know we'll you know we can, we'll see. I don't I don't know. I like I said, I have a couple ideas regarding it, but um, you know it's possible. It's possible. And and you know I think there is a marriage there. You know Jimmy's thinking marketing. I'm just thinking musically <laughs> a little bit. I, like listening to the Category Seven album. You know, look. I guess our frame of reference is always going to be the bands that the members of category seven were in so you kind of listen especially when you listen for the first time or the second time you're like oh that's a little armored sainty and that's a little machine heady and that's a little you know overkill but you know talking about you specifically i really didn't think a lot of this sounded like armored saint but there were times where i said that's a bit of an anthrax groove not so much a riff but i'm like there's a couple, and maybe because there are some grooves on this record that I just thought there were some grooves there that sounded a little anthraxy. And then it got me saying, you know, if this band would do headline gigs, you know, they would only have 10 songs to play. You know, that is very logical. So, um, you know, but remember, those guys are also in bands as well. So, right. yeah. you know, we could pull something from each band. If we That's want. right. That's I, right. I think it's, it's this, you know, it's this. This is the thing. It's, it's the voice. You know, the voice is the thing that kind of, like I could write, I could do like a, you know, folky trip hop, um, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, like a bluegrass song, and you know, somebody could hear and go, kind of sounds like Saint, and it's like, yeah, it's me. That's why it sounds like Saint. So um, it's this, you know. So I think that's that's the one uh, component that always is going to bring it bring it around. I mean, if Joey Belladonna did a side project and it was still just say it's 
you know, I mean, I, don't, I haven't heard his journey things per se, but it would probably still sound a little bit like Anthrax because it's him. It's his voice. Right. So, you know what I mean? Like the voice is always going to be the thing that is the driving force to making a band sound the way it does. Um, you know, back in when I joined Anthrax and when people first heard only, they, as some people said, that sounds like Armored Saint. It's like, well, not really, but like I, it's because it's, it's the voice. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. We'll, 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 I will see, you know, it's anything's possible. Land I used to love. All right. Just talk to us about that theme. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I just watched, um, uh, my wife and I, we just watched American George Carlin's American dream. I don't know if you've seen that documentary. It's, it's yeah. really cool. Brilliant. I mean, he really is the king, that guy, after seeing that, I was like, really, he is the king of comedy. He really was. But, um, you know, I use the one line in that song about George Carlin, you know, you know, even Carlin would survive in these times. It's like, you know, I think it's, you know, it's all kind of lyrically, it's all based on what we're experiencing in, in not, not only the U.S., but everywhere now, in particular, as well as Europe and Canada's got it as well. And, and even South America, just the division of, of people's, you know, perspectives. And, um, you know, I think that's a struggle right now. And it's, it's, it's certainly a lot of topics for songs. And, um, you know, it's, it's a bummer because I think that for the most part, people's general views of the way they want to live are fairly similar. I think that back in, you know, 20 years, and I was, I've never been that political, but really, if you, if you go back like 20, 30 years, you, people who are never political, they, they just would kind of be a little bit uh, apathetic towards politics, most people, and they just kind of lived. And I think there was a common bond of a lot of people, regardless of what political side you were on, that you just kind of had a, a view of that was considered to be the middle. And the middle used to be kind of an area where people just were like, you know, whatever. They don't, they didn't care so much about stuff. They just want to have a good life. But in this modern day where the is so polar opposite and it's really the driving force is driven by the, 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 the hardcore people on both ends. And um, I find myself really not really relate, relating to either one of those groups, to be honest. So like, I kind of find like I'm mostly in the middle and I could, and I know a lot of people are there too. And those people are considered to be kind of like, I don't know, almost like indifferent, you know, the middle, but um, you know, the, the, the people on both extremes, I'm like, I, you know, you're just too extreme for me. Um, and you are too, you know, over there. So um, it's, it's kind of just basically talking about that, how like everybody feels like their perspective is the right one, no matter how extreme it is. And, um, it's like, oh, well, you know what? You're pretty annoying, actually, I think. So, <laughs> so, John, it's great that we have you to explain that to us. But as a writer, do you worry? Because we just know in this world, you know, people read the headline and they react. They don't necessarily click on the article and thoroughly read the article. And you have some titles. Some like I'll say, when I got the record, you know, before even listening to it, there was a number of song titles that grabbed my attention. I'm like, oh, I, I want to read these lyrics. And Jimmy mentioned one of them land i used to love and you can see how a title like land i used to love if someone just reads the title they can get, kind of get bent out of shape but then you got through pink eyes which could be taken a certain way if you don't really get into it apple of discord yeah. uh you know white flags and bayonets like there's some pretty heavy stuff if you just look at the title so do you worry right. that you're just going to judge right. the book by its cover I mean, well, hopefully not. Hopefully people will read the lyrics. And, and again, the lyrics are there to just be a thought. I mean, um, I just kind of, my way of trying to write is just kind of raising ideas and thoughts. I'm not, I'm not a person who's going to go, you should think this way. I'm not going to do that because I just, I, I may change my mind. You know, I find that this world sometimes where people live in where they think a certain way, and then that's it. That's the way they think for the, what the rest of their life. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that we're struggling with is nobody's really communicating and nobody is really good trying to hear the other perspective. And I think that's a, a big problem. So, you know, I think you're, you're better served if you, you know, you kind of, you're willing to have a couple different viewpoints. And um, I don't know, to me, that just seems to be 
the better way to to kind of live life. And um, I think that we're struggling with that as a, as a society, to be honest. So, um, yeah. but yeah, I don't want to, you know, like you take a band like Rage Against the Machine, which is an incredible band. They were awesome, of course, but they, you know, it was very specific to an opinion. And um, not that I think maybe their opinion was wrong based on the scenario. I mean, um, you know, Zach Del Rocha is an awesome singer and front man and you know, has, but like maybe you don't completely agree with all the thought processes that go into it, you know, and, um, and you can do that. And, and having an open mind, I think, is to your benefit to, to say, oh, you know what? Now that I think about it after having this conversation or after thinking more about it, maybe I don't feel as steadfast in that pos position as I did over here, you know? Um, and I think that's called growth. I mean, <laughs> what's wrong with that? Like, you don't think the same as you did 10 years ago about lots of stuff. But, you know, but these political things, all of a sudden it feels like you have to believe this. And if you don't believe that, you know, then you're over here. And I, I don't know. I, I, I just... I feel does like it does it does it sometimes seem that it's 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 social media that's actually destroyed the fabric of society, uh, media and social media? They're all trying to cash in on division. Well, I, let, I, let's face it, happiness doesn't get clicks, right? Right. I mean, I don't have any. I don't have social media at all. Neither me or my wife do. We decided no a long time ago. We, you know, even the labels. Like, dude, are you kidding? You can't like come on. <laughs> You know, like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'll do any, do as many interviews as you want, but I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not getting an Instagram account or Facebook account because to promote myself, I, I just, I can't because I, I think so low of it. But um, yeah, I think it's the, I think it's actually one of the biggest problems. Uh, and that, that has been in the last 20 years um, for society, to be honest. And a lot of people are like, oh, it's done some good stuff. It's like, what? So you can so go on a vacation and you can post some pictures of your trip in you know, Cancun and you can send that to the people and they give you a thumbs up like, yeah, that's rad. You're laying on the beach and who cares? Like, I mean, like, why does this matter to like if you send it to the people that you actually care about and you know, you could text that to them and then they, but why does it have to go to all these people? And, you know, I always found it funny when people are getting their houses breaking in, broken into because, you know, they're showing that their vacations and people were finding out and they're going, great, you're not home. I'm going to break into the house. And I love that. So, I mean, I don't know. That's just my opinion. I can't stand social media. I hate it. I think it's done way worse for society than any positives it's done. So yes, I think they're a big problem in it too. Um, you know, again, I think that I'll just summarize it by thinking, just saying that really, I think most people probably are somewhat similar in their thought process. Some of it, you know, wavers a little depending on what it is, but for the most part, I think the general public is kind of in the middle. I think there's polar people on both sides that are have their agenda and they don't really care about what anyone really thinks they're just they want their agenda accomplished and they're probably the scary people well john i'll compliment you because i'll say a lot of these all-star group records you kind of get the sense the record was written by like a house or staff record a staff staffer of the record label and you know and I, actually i know that's the case in some of these all-star band records wow. but this you kind of see that like you know you kind of clearly put a lot of thought into this and i think when people hear the record they're going to enjoy that it's a heavy fast record like they like but they're going to see that there's some really well thought out well crafted songs and themes here so yeah well I mean, it's really cool i mean you got you know when people ask me i try to generalize it in, in like a, a paragraph and i was like you, these are it's riff mania because there's riffs everywhere there's yeah. incredible rhythms and um really powerful uh you know uh, rhythms that are are, are um, supplemented by really well orchestrated uh, orchestrated songs with big hooks, actually. So um, you have those that combination, but you have really amazing players and all these guys. And um, you know, there's no denying that everybody is very skilled. So um, you know, do you can, but you can have a record like that of just a bunch of gibberish. Um, but then having like really cool songs, that's the key component. So. I think you've always been a, an artist that 
you're very careful in what you do and what you pick, right? And and this shows. I think that's what Perrin's alluding to. It's it doesn't seem like a house sort of record, right? It seems like you care about the project just as much as you care about any other project you've been. In. Yeah, well, anything I've done, I just wanted to you know have the certain quality level that I I expected to have. You know, again, I'm my biggest critic. So if you know, to to me, it's like if if it, if I think it's great. You know, without sounding arrogant, then it's great. You know, and then I believe in it. You know, if I don't believe it's great, then I don't want to do it, and I don't want to certainly don't want to release it to the public. So, you know, my career has always been one where I've never made millions of dollars. So, you know, I, to me, the more important aspect is, is the quality of the music, and um, that's the one thing you can kind of control anyway. You can't control sales, you can't control fame. So, you you know, you just hope for the best. And, I just kind of, I'm more concerned with just it being great. And so everyone knows that we're not just stroking John Z. Go with his writing ability. The last song on the record, <laughs> is, the last song on the record is an eight minute instrumental called uh, yes, Edder Storman. Yeah. And folks, yeah. it kicks ass. It kicks it's a ass. Kick, ass, kick ass eight minute instrumental to end the record. And what a way to end the record. So, and, and I could just see that being jammed out live by uh John Mike Sipton, Mike whatever. Orlando it's just fun. takes it to the next level with guitar work. He just is insane. Yeah. He's a really amazing, talented guy. Mike's amazing, really awesome person on top of it. And, um, you know, I didn't even know Mike. You know, I didn't know him at all. Like when I got to, we started kind of working together and writing together, but I really did not know him as a person. So it was cool to actually kind of just kind of determine a like a friendship and a build um a relationship almost strictly on music which is really cool you know because we didn't know each other so i mean we've exchanged mostly texts or emails and um you know when i met him i was like oh you're mike orlando so um it was it was kind of cool that way it's really just all based on music you know and the interesting thing is you know I think you guys are all from different places geographically and right there was always a, a kind of southern california sound there was the bay area sound and you had the kind of east coast thrash sound so jason as i think more of an uh, an east coast guy as is mike you're obviously always been in southern california and then you have a couple bay area guys in the band too and i think the album's actually you know a pretty cool melting pot of just american heavy music and and i think yeah. People will kind of pick that up a little bit. Oh yeah, that's a little you know. There's there's I can't remember which song it is, but I I kind of really felt like it was this you know I lived in the Bay Area for five years and I heard my share of you know Exodus and 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 you know violence not just Machine Head but violence and like right. I kind of hear some of that. So different songs you hear kind of yeah that's kind of like that New York Boston kind of vibe. That's the kind of Bay Area vibe. You no, know, that's a little Southern California. So I thought that was a pretty cool thing about the record also. Right. And keep in mind, Mike, you know, is, is more of a recent musician. I mean, yeah. everybody's a little older, of course, too. I'm, I'm sure that I'm the oldest, but, um, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, birth dates are a little different. So we're like Jason came in with Shadows Fall and, um, you know, that was more of a modern. Well, they're, I mean, now they've been around for a while, of course, um, as Adrenaline Mob was probably the most recent band of all everybody's bands. But um, that I, I, I kind of dig that too. So it's not a bunch of, it's not five guys who, you know, were from the eighties. So, I mean, me and Phil, and, but I, I don't even, I don't think Jack even joined Exodus till after, you know, no, exactly. He was more so, in the two thousands. Yeah. Yeah. So like you have a bunch of guys who are from different times as well, which is cool. Yeah. That's a good point. Good Would point. you have changed anything in your career? You say, you know what? I should have done that instead of this. Um, yeah, I would have. Yeah, for sure. Um, just probably some business decisions that were made and, um, you know, mostly that, um, I really wouldn't, you know, musically, um, I pretty much accept most of the things I've done musically. I don't think, you know, I could tell you songs on records that I think are not good in my opinion or, or subpar. I don't ever mention them because I've done that and people are like, I love that song. And I <laughs> saw, but really burst somebody's bubble there. But, um, you know, um, but I, regardless of whether I love it or not, I kind of accept it. Um, you know, when I was talking to somebody earlier and they were saying, would you read, you know, about re-recording something old? And I was like, no, because that was the way the record was meant to be made then. So even like March of the Saint, which I've said, and we've said numerous times in, in the past that, you know, 
the mix wasn't quite the way we thought it should have been because, you know, we were this garage band that was, you know, just really uh, live, uh, you know, just a train rolling along and, you know, very loose. Um, and then the record didn't demonstrate that, but it, you know, it's the way it was and it came out too polished, but that's the way it was. And so I don't want to go back and re-record it. Like I don't, it's just, I accept it for what it was then, but yeah, mostly just some, probably some business decisions that were made. Like we didn't go to Europe. Armored Saint didn't tour Europe until the, well, we didn't even tour there. We played the Dynamo Festival in 1988. And that was the first time, excuse me, 1989. And that was the first time we set foot on European soil. And this is after, you know, the first three records came out. We, and we, you know, I was on the cover of Kerrang! And we had all this press and we kept going to the label going, can we go to Europe? Like, I was on the cover of this magazine. They I might like us. They uh, might like us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're like, we're, we'll probably be really big there, bigger than we are here. And, um, you know, whatever the powers that be, we're like, no, just focus on America. And we're like, but, but everyone's going here. It's Anthrax and, you know, Motley Crue and Metallica and Rat and, where are we? But here I am in this magazine. Like uh, it was a terrible decision and one of the worst ones that you know we made. And we didn't make it. It was the powers of B and um and it set us back in Europe. And I guarantee, I mean, I can't say to what success level, but if we would have toured on March of the Saint all through Europe, we would have been pretty big. Like we we would have been bigger than we were in America, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Mm. Well, I right. guess everything happens for a reason, right? It does. So, so, so we started of Saint and we're ending of Saint. So just really quickly, because we know you need to kind of do some other things. But uh, you guys have a video coming out, I think, tomorrow, actually. You do. So. Yeah, it's going to be cool. It's uh, it's really cool. It's um, it's a, a cover of the Four Tops song, um, One Chain Don't Make No Prison. So it's, um, it's very different for Armored Saint. But it's not at the same time, because... We kind of grew up on that music. We always loved old school R and B and um, and soul music. Is you know we just we did. You know we were listening to that kind of music when we were you know 13 and 14 years old um, when we'd come home from from school and uh, junior high and and play Kiss Alive and then we'd play Earth Wind and Fire Gratitude and like we we really did love all kinds of the music. John, we, John when when you were young with Joey, I mean you guys what elementary? Elementary, yeah. Did you go like, I'm going to be the singer and I'm going to be the bassist? Did you kind of like delegate what, what, what you're going to do? I originally was, I bought a bass and, um, <laughs> and then I had a bass and that bass Joey still has actually. And then <laughs> so I'm trying to play this bass going, this doesn't feel right. And then Joey goes, well, let me check it out. And he got in. And then like, it works the for me. <laughs> so you're going to be the singer and I'm going to be the bassist. Is that yeah, what happened? I mean, you know, we kind of worked it out. We did our a junior high band and um, that was even before Guns on Phil came into the picture and, and Joey actually played guitar in that band, um, but I was a singer, and then that kind of got the ball rolling. But yeah, you know, we, uh, you know, I kind of had the personality of a, of a lead singer, even though I'm not that much of a dick. Uh, I can be a dick um, on, on occasion, but um, I'm not a typical lead singer. But I have some of the traits. But um, usually, lead singers have the what they say the lead singer disease. But I'm really not like that. I'm a pretty nice guy right? for the most part. But I can be right. a dick. Uh, on that note, <laughs> July 26th, the uh, debut album from uh, Category 7 on Metal Blade Records. It's going to be released. Everybody go pre-order, pick it up. Before then, of course. Yeah. And the same video comes out tomorrow, so check it out. It's cool. We're all wearing, like, suits. We look we look really dapper. It's really cool. Very cool. And the new Armored Saint album is going to – it's in the works. It's in the works. It's in the works. We're writing songs. I just was showing Joe – I was telling Joey that I was listening to the songs that we already demoed, and they sound killer. So I'm really stoked. I got actually very excited about it after after, him, after a while, not listening to it, what it sounded like. So. Well, we wish you all the success. Look forward to seeing you again on tour, and thank you for everything. Thanks, guys. Thanks for all the support and, and you know, all the love that you've given Armored Saint and my career through the years. And um, – it was fun hanging out in Montreal on the bus and uh, doing this here. And, you know, I well, hopefully we'll come back to uh, and do Quebec City next time I'm there, man. I'm really pissed that we didn't play there between. Yeah, and they, they this time we do. When a band only plays Montreal, they'll, they're so loyal, they will drive two and a half hours to come to Montreal, but they're not happy about it. So, yeah. You, uh, you I'm pissed. I mean, 
I want him to come to Quebec City. It's a great city, and I, I want to play there. And, and I'm well, apologetic. The, this, this time we'll get you an Expos uh, shirt or something so you can wear it on stage. I have an Expos hat. You know, I love get you a Nordiques shirt. We'll get you like a Nordiques shirt. I would love a Nordiques shirt. Retro, retro man. Awesome. Yeah. All right, man. Have yourself a one great day. All right, guys. Thanks for everything. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Thanks for all the all love. Right. Take care. Yeah, man. Bye -bye.